Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about the ABI challenge. Uh, there's going to be some uh, inline name spaces in here too, uh, so you might already have a sense of where I'm going with this. I think there might be some useful points uh, in here. Uh, so my name is Arvid Norberg. I've been writing C++ since 97. Uh, I'm the co-author of Lua Bind, which is an old Lua binding uh, library inspired by Boost Python. Uh, more recently, I'm also the author of LibTorrent, which is a BitTorrent library. Uh, I work at Blockstream, and we do cryptocurrency and blockchain platforms. So let's get into it. Uh, why do I want to talk about ABIs? Uh, in my experience, a lot of people run into ABI issues, uh, sometimes even without understanding or knowing why or what's going on. Uh, and I think this is a problem that's uh, increasing with the proliferation of C++ versions. Uh, you, know, you build something, a, li a library with one version of C++, you link it uh, with a different. So basically this is based on my experience uh, as a library author. Uh, the other issue is that when you run, in run into ABI issues, you get memory corruption, uh, which is partly uh, the reason why you don't understand what's going on. Uh, if you're lucky, you get link errors. And I also get the impression from sort of community at large that few people really appreciate this problem. Uh, you see very little like, talk about it. Uh, and I am a little bit disappointed with the state of build uh, systems as well. I wish builds and developers would pay more attention to this issue. Um, and especially for novices, it's really difficult because it's a complicated concept. Uh, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, a brief introduction of what, what an AVI is. Um, how linking symbols is done in C and C++, name mangling, uh, and what happens when you have ABI errors in practice. Uh, a little bit about build systems and what they should do uh, to avoid these issues, or some of them at least, mitigate them. Uh, and inline namespaces, and lastly, four declarations, uh, and we'll get into details why. Um, so an ABI is the interface, it's short for application binary interface, it's the interface between uh, two objects of machine code. Uh, it's sort of like an API, but at the machine code level. So APIs uh, talk about language concepts, ABIs talk about machine code and machine state concepts. Uh, if you have a compatible API and you switch out one of these components, you can recompile and it should work if you have a compatible ABI and you have two you know, objects of machine code, you can switch one out and just link them together and it will work. Uh, but API compatibility does not imply ABI compatibility. You might have to actually rebuild everything uh, that you're touching. So things that determine ABIs are how do you call a function? And you know there are lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, one of my favorites are passing two 32-bit arguments into a through a single 64-bit register. That's pretty cool. Uh, or splitting a class that has two fields into, uh, into registers. Uh, so another thing I want to highlight here is uh, return value optimization. This is something that everyone has been doing for a long time, but it became mandatory in C++17, which means that, in theory, you could have had an, an implementation that didn't have RVO in pre-17, but now has it in 17. Uh, so that also affects the ABI. Um, perhaps the more common places where we see ABI uh, issues is in class layouts. Uh, so vtable layout is one uh, thing, obviously, but that doesn't change very much. How we pad fields, uh, how we align fields uh, in classes. You have the empty base class optimization. Uh, you also have this new uh, no unique address. If you have members with no unique address, depending on whether your compiler supports that uh, attribute or not, you might have different ABIs, so that has to match. Uh, and you have std pair, there's a sort of the old style pair, which was simple, and then there's the new style pair that is compressed. Uh, std string also is, you know, the libstud C++ std string changed from the um, copy and write to small string optimization, which also affects ABI, obviously. So this is primarily a problem when you're linking shared libraries together, because shared libraries are sort of built far apart by different people. Um, uh, so if you build with different C++ versions, for instance, uh, or if you build with different defines, uh, this lib, uh, glibcxx use cxx11 ABI is uh, the thing that affects the layout of std string, for instance. Um, 
So that has to match on both sides of the shared object. Uh, so I'm pro mostly going to cover these. So let's um, review how linking works. Uh, let's say you define a function f in one translation unit and you call it from another. So you have something like that looks like this. Int f takes uh, an int, uh, and in main you have a declaration of f, and then you call it. So the first thing you do is you compile uh, these two files into object files. One object file will have the definition of f, the other one will have a reference to f. You link them together, the linker will see, ah, here's a reference to f, here's the definition, let's connect them together. How does the linker know that they are the same? Well, you name them. So let's st first look at C. What's, uh, the traditional uh, thing that happens in C is you compile these to object files and then you look at those object files with a tool, for instance, nm, very convenient to look at what's in object files. Um, you'll see there's an underscore f on both sides. Uh, the t means it's a defined symbol, the u means it's an external symbol. Uh, and you can also tell that the name mangling traditionally done, used in C is to add an underscore prefix to the name. Uh, imagine that you would change this f function to now take a float and return a float. Uh, the name mangling in, in, in C traditionally will still uh, have these functions have the same name. Uh, they link together as if they were the same and you get memory corruption. This is sort of uh, basically an example of, of uh, ABA problems. Now, what does C++ do? Well, when we compile these two object files, we'll see uh, they are ha actually have different names. So the symbol name uh, will mismatch and the linker will actually complain. So what's going on here? C++ encodes uh, part of the signature uh, in its names because C++ supports overloading. So clearly they cannot have, functions in, in, in a, an overload set clearly cannot have the same name in the linker. So this, this actually uh, increases type safety to some, to some extent, and that's really nice. Uh, there is a but. If you have a user-defined type, that's just encoded by name in, in, this, uh, um, in the symbol name. And also return types are norm normally not included, so you can still screw up there uh, without the linker catching it. So here's an example. Let's say you have struct foobar. You have a function that takes a foobar const reference. Uh, the name in the linker will be something, something, foobar. So foobar is encoded in the, in the linker name. But what is a foobar exactly? How can we be sure that both sides of the shared library agrees on what a foobar is? Uh, we can't, necessarily. For instance, uh, imagine that your foobar looks like this. When you build it in debug mode, you have one layout. When you build it in release mode, you have a different layout. So really, there are two foobars here, but they have the same name. So the name mangling here won't actually help you. Uh, so this is an ODR violation. I don't need to really go through the standard ODR. No diagnostic required. It's bad. We have to avoid it. That's basically the uh, short version of it. So uh, it is hard to maintain uh, ABI compatibility um, across C++ uh, C++ versions and even across other uh, build configurations as well. It's very easy to introduce um, uh, breaking changes like this. Uh, so I want to I bring up some quotes from the boost mailing list uh, from Peter Dimov. At some point, we'll need to acknowledge the problem which results from building boost with one standard and, uh, and user code with another. So basically, um, boost system users of boost system <coughs> uh, had a lot of problems with this because uh, uh, error code would have different ABIs depending on which C++ versions uh, you used. That's been solved in quotes by being heterolly now. So, uh, And another quote from Degski, not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, the thing that should work and the only thing that can be guaranteed to work is when your whole code base is compiled with the same compiler and with the same standard, uh, and I would add to that, and the same compiler flags. So what happens in the wild? Um, so normally when you have um, shared libraries and binaries that link together, you have 
binaries be built in release mode and clients built in debug mode, for example, or other uh, mismatching build configurations. Uh, or you have a library built in C++11 and a client built in C++14. Uh, another sort of related issue is you may pick up header files for the same library from a different location that mismatches the, the library that you're linking to. That also happens in the wild. Um, <coughs> right. So, so actually, the for the for the re uh, release and debug mode issue, it's actually easier to have happen than you than you imagine because uh, many standard libraries actually have different uh, types for um, say vector uh, in debug and release mode. Normally, standard libraries are really good at making sure that these are link errors, uh, but still. So here's. Uh, an example from Peter Demo. If you have um, a struct by that sometimes have a move constructor, if you're building with C11 or later, you have a move constructor, but otherwise you don't. If you build this library in C98 uh, and you link against it from a client that's built from C uh, with C11 or later, the client is going to expect that this function exists in the library, but it's not going to be there. So that, that, that's a problem. That's going to be a linker, though, fortunately. Uh, another example, um, when you build this, std string might be some, one, one version of std string. When you're linking against it, std string might be something else. So uh, depending on which version of C++ you're using. And normally, the return type is never uh, encoded in the, in the mangled name of a symbol. Uh, so these are kind of artificial examples. Here's an example from the actual real, real world. Imagine you have a std map, and with C++14, we have this really nice feature where you can have a transparent com uh, like comparison objects or types. Uh, so you have a map of string to T, and you want to be able to do lookups in this map with string views, so you don't have to unnecessarily construct a std string. So then you have this String view less, which is you know implemented with is transparent uh, set and all that, uh, but this only works if you're in C plus fourteen. So if you want to be backwards compatible to clients that use an older version of C plus, you might do something like this: like, oh, we're in greater than C plus eleven, then do that. Otherwise, uh, like suck it up and uh, and and. Uh, Create your own map string that just pays the cost of constructing these, but then you can still take a string view, but you sort of abstract away the, the cost of uh, creating that std string. So if this is exposed to clients, that's, this is also going to be an ABI break because these types are actually different. So if you build a library with one version and, and linking is different, um, you're going to have trouble. So, my point here is it's really easy to introduce these kinds of incompatibilities if you're not really careful. Uh, fortunately, standard library uh, implementers are really careful, uh, but this goes beyond that, right? This is for any shared object that you link against. So what can we do to mitigate these problems? Uh, I have a few ideas. Um, I think we can have better build systems that don't link incompatible objects together or like don't at least don't encourage you to set up your build such that you get incompatible objects uh, linked together. Um, you can have better libraries that turn runtime errors into link time errors. And we'll touch a little bit on that uh, in a bit. Uh, and I also think just increased, increased awareness among sort of people in the community that you have to be careful about this. And when you see memory corruption, the first thing you should think is ABI issues. So, what can we do with build systems? Um, the, the best way, the most reliable way you can ensure that your project doesn't suffer from these problems is to build all of your dependencies from source code with the same build system, with the same compiler flags, same version C++, everything the same. Uh, and you know, that's what many big companies do, which you know, is great. Uh, you might want to use a build system that actually makes sure that uh, it doesn't build different uh, parts of your project with different 
uh, compiler flags, uh, or at least doesn't sort of prod you and like trying to make you do that because. All right. Um, so I'm going to go through some examples of properties that I think good build systems need to have. Uh, so this is my example. I have two binaries that I want to build, foo.exe and bar.exe. And the color here indicates which ABI I'm building with. So ABI here means any compiler flags, essentially. It's version of C++, uh, if we're using the C++11 ABI from glibc, anything that alters the ABI. Uh, so your build system has better build two versions of libfoo, one yellow and one, is that blue? Cyan, maybe. Uh, and two versions of libbar. Right? You can't link the wrong colors together. So ABI requirements or properties propagate down your build tree. So foo.exe was configured to have yellow ABI. All of its dependencies needs to be built with yellow ABI. Example two, let's say libfoo must have yellow ABI. Maybe it's a pre-built pre binary that you don't have any control over, and it happened to be built with yellow ABI. Now bar.exe is trying to link against it. <coughs> libfoo works, okay, that's fine, but your build system has better fail to build bar. That should not be okay. So restrictions propagate up the dependency tree, yes? Is there something in the files themselves that allows you to tell anything about this? I don't think yeah. you're shaking your head. Yeah. I don't think so. Other than maybe the naming of the library. And that. Yeah. So, so one of the problems is that um, you'd have to know all the compiler flags that have an impact on ABI, um, but like it's not even clear, even for compiler implementers, like what, uh, like some combination of flags are compatible, yeah. but some are not. And like even most compiler folks don't know exactly what is the level of support for say I dash f or API, but uh, dash f exceptions for the other way. Right? right, so the comment was, uh, it's really difficult to know which compiler flags uh, affect API. Uh, yes, it's a very difficult problem. And uh, and even even just an include path could potentially alter the API. Uh, yes, Marshall. Yeah, my, my favorite is of course f short nums which just uh, destroys your ABI. But um, your examples here are, are really simplistic and there's a bunch of things there that you don't control. Um, you have a Mac, so you, you're you using libc++, it's a dialog, you can't rebuild it. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the things that libc++ depends on as well. Um, there's the compiler RT, there's the libunwine, there's all these things. Again, you don't have any control over them. They just, they come from your vendor. And you don't know yeah. how they're built. Like you don't know right. how I build my Lipsy process yeah. when I ship it. Yeah, right. Them. So the, the, the comment is that you depend on a lot of things that you can't rebuild, like the standard library and all those dependencies. Yes, fortunately though, they are, you know, they think through this. I th or would you, are you saying that if you try to link against a pre-built Lipsy plus with F short enums, you're screwed? Um, if you build your own, if you build your own Lipsy plus plus, with F short enums and then build all your stuff with yeah. F short enums and all the small libraries that Lib C depends on, you might get away with it. But there's so that's a that's that's a non trivial set of things. Yes. And uh, I would argue uh, that if you are a big company that employs this sort of mono repo and you build all your dependencies, you probably want to build your standard library also as part of that. And then, yeah, and there is a company that does that. I think I think more than one, but yeah. Um, uh, example three. This is a little bit, uh, a little bit outside of, of ABI technically, I suppose, but it's it's common in the wild. Uh, let's say that you are linking against libbar, so you have an include directory where bar.hpp is, and you have uh, you're linking against libfoo, and you have an include directory where foo.hpp is. You just also happen to have <coughs> libbar installed on your system in quotes, so you have another version of bar.hpp on the user local include. Your build system has better not use that one, right? You want to use the one that is part of your build tree. Uh, also happens in the wild. Uh, and the exact same problem for uh, actual pre-built uh, binaries. If you have a, an installed uh, library, you shouldn't use that. You should use the, the version of the library from your build tree. Um, in fact, I, th yes. I don't want to derail the talk, but there is a lot more to static archives. And if you are uh, like, 
like shipping static archives to customers, like you probably don't know what you're doing. So let's talk about it after. But like, and I just I just want to say like there is a lot it, more than that. That's a fair point. Static archive might not be the best example. There are ship static archives though uh, that comes with the system. The yeah. Yeah. Like, right. Right. The comment was you shouldn't ship static archives. Yes. Uh, um, I, I am I'm the impression though that the capital <coughs> dash uh, capital L linker option is probably uh, you should probably want not want to use that if you if you are linking against static library if you're linking dynamic library you probably need to to use that to pick it up right um, um, all right I think boost build gets pretty close to this or at least boost build sort of has uh, an intention of try to uh, have some rigor in in the build configurations uh, which. I wish I would see in other build systems as well. Um, but clearly, there's like uh, a better build system is not going to solve all the problems. If you have third-party dependencies, uh, it's still going to be in, uh, like a challenge to to build those in some way where you can be uh, confident that uh, it's compatible. Uh, OpenSSL is my favorite example where. Last time I checked, uh, you have like Perl script to build it, and you need an assembler. And it's difficult to integrate with other build systems. Um, so your library might be distributed as a binary, whether you like it or not. Uh, so then it's like the question is, is that your problem as a library author, or is that the client slash package management system's problem? And I think, I think this is a little bit of a gray zone, and I think uh, as a library, uh, developer, I should take more responsibility to make sure that even if packagers and users don't really uh, think about ABI compatibility properly, uh, they still shouldn't get memory corruption. So that's when we enter inline namespaces. This is a feature that can help you with this, and I feel like it's underused. Uh, as far as I know, it's primarily used in standard uh, libraries implementation to, to you know, ensure ABI compatibility. So inline namespaces let you inject information into your uh, symbol names without altering the API. So the API is the language, the, what you type in your source code, and the ABI are the names that comes out in the object files. So it lets you and code more information in your symbol names without uh, your users know, knowing about it. Uh, so let's go back to the example of the foobar that were really two foobars, one release foobar and one debug foobar. Um, we, can, uh, we can give it two names. So this is what it looked like, struct foobar, index, and into debug state. Um, we can introduce an inline namespace like this. So if we're in release mode, we say inline namespace rel, uh, otherwise inline namespace debug. And then we have to close the, the namespace uh, at the bottom. Users will still just use this as if it's called foobar. They won't actually see or necessarily see uh, rel and debug. Uh, so if you compile this and you look at the, at the object files, you'll see dbg is there and rel is there. And if you try to mismatch a link, uh, you get an error message saying that foo dbg doesn't exist. And then you can, that's sort of a hint that maybe foo release exists. Uh, the alternative would be memory corruption, essentially. So just a brief reminder or review of what inline namespaces are. They're pretty old by now, since they're, they came in C++11. Uh, but they make all of their uh, declarations available in the surrounding scope as if they don't exist. So for instance, uh, if you in your library code have a namespace v1 and int, uh, int f, the client code can just call f uh, or like my library colon colon f or using my library colon colon f and just call f as if v1 isn't there. Um, not necessary in user code. And you can specialize templates. This is another aspect, uh, important aspect to make uh, to create the illusion that the inline namespace isn't there. So in your library code, you can have uh, a template type name t struct foobar, and your client code can specialize that template without mentioning 
uh, in line names with v1, as if uh, v1 is not there. So this can be used to encode ABI information in your symbols, but it can also be used to encode versions of your functions. Uh, so to go back to libstud C++ std string, uh, this is sort of an illustration of sort of what they do. Uh, not supposed to be exact, but... Uh, so you have the two basic strings, one that has the short string optimization and one that has the copy and write uh, implementation. Uh, one is in names with CXX11, one in names with CXX98. Uh, and at the top of this file, you can say, if, we, if, if the user has opted in to use the CXX11 API or ABI, then we make the CXX11 namespace inline. Otherwise, we make the CXX98 namespace inline. So whether namespace is inline or not depends on its first, um, the, the first time you open it in a translation unit. That's how this works. It it's, uh, actually makes it kind of nice. You can move your configuration to the top of the file. Um, you can't do the, op the other way around, by the way. You can't uh, make an inline namespace non-inline. Non uh, and if you try to open it as inline after you've opened it as non-inline, that's uh, an error. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, you can use this to uh, encode uh, versions of your functions in your library to provide backwards compatibility. For example, uh, you have a function um, f in the inline namespace, namespace v1. The client, or oh, sorry, the, the implementation of it uh, is also in the namespace v1, and you do some work. You take a string, a std string. Uh, then you uh, upgrade, and you want to pass in a string view instead. If you were to just change this to string view and recompile, an older client that was looking for the function that takes a string it would no longer link because it wouldn't find the function it was looking for. So you can introduce a new version of f. So um, similar to the previous slide, uh, you, you say either v1 is inline or v2 is inline, depending on uh, what you're building. If you're building against the old uh, API or the new API. Uh, if you're making the v2 inline, when you're compiling against this header, you're going to get the string view version of this. But in the binary, you're going to have both versions, uh, since they have different names. One is v1, one is v2. Uh, and in your implementation, you can just you know, make the old function forward to the to new one. So a symbol's actual namespace is an implementation detail. This has been true for a long time, but it, uh, using inline namespaces makes it especially obvious that it's an implementation detail. Uh, so under no circumstances can a client forward declare your, you being the library authors, uh, your uh, types. So imagine, for instance, that you have client code like this. You're using your third party foo type and you only declare a pointer to it. So you don't actually need foo to be a complete type. Um, so why do you want to, you, like, if you don't want to pay the price of including someone like a third party header file, it might be tempting. Right, sorry, I'm the slide behind. That does not need to be a complete type because it's a pointer. It might be tempting to just forward declare foo, even though it comes from a third party library. Uh, the third party library could look like this. It could have an inline name, this v2 struct foo, in which case your code will not link against this. Uh, there are other reasons, obviously. Uh, this is bad also. Um, For instance, if third party is a namespace alias, you wouldn't even be able to open it. If the next version of the library makes third party a namespace alias, you can't open it. Or if struct foo really is a type def to something else, your forward declaration also wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work. So there are all, all lots of reasons to, to not forward declare this. Uh, however, though, this still, uh, the, the question still remains, what should you do as a client when you don't need a, a, a complete type? I think uh, libraries should provide forward declaration headers so that you can get a cheap way, like a, have a cheap way to receive uh, uh, a library's type uh, and not be tempted to, to create your own forward declarations. 
so importantly, these four declarations are controlled by the library, and the library can do whatever it wants in there. It can make the make the types type defs. It can put them in, in any inline namespace. So this is my call to action for any any library uh, author in here. Pro is this, yes. Uh, I think there's one. I was F. Yeah. The, these, are, these are the ones I could find. Uh, so iOS forward in, in standard and net forward from the networking TS. Uh, and there are some in boost. S some of the forward headers in boost are details uh, also. Uh, but uh, surprisingly few libraries actually provide forward uh, declaration headers, as far as I could find at least. Yes. Uh, Louis comment is uh, it's convenient place to, to keep documentation, uh, and I think that it would be nice to have a tool, someone to write a tool to generate the forward declaration here. Um, so uh, that's that's all the material I have. Here are some uh, like takeaways. My summary: uh, build dependencies from source, uh, use good build systems, uh, or at least know the limitations of the build systems you you use. Uh, use inline namespaces for uh, backwards compatible upgrades to your ABIs uh, or your APIs uh, uh, and also for ABI safe build configurations. You can encode other things than just release debug, uh, debug and release, right? You can debug, you can, you could encode version of C++ that you're building with uh, or any other build configuration that is uh, um, dependent on, on your library, like are you link, which crypto library are you linking against, for instance. Uh, and provide for declaration headers. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Charles. So, so you didn't mention exception throwing. So, you know, if you throw an object to binary erase type, and if it goes across the module boundary. I've seen some ABI issues there. Have you, have you observed that in the observation? Uh, right. So the question is, what about uh, ABI compatibility with exception objects? Right. The, there are, I think there are many issues there. Some, like, partly that the exception object itself might not be exported from the shared library, so you might run into issues there. Uh, but also, uh, since you require RTTI, the RTTI information might not be exported. And sometimes, I think mostly in the past, you had problems where RTTI across uh, shared libraries didn't really work well because they compared the pointers of the type info names instead of the actual they still names. Do. They still do. In some cases. Yeah, right. Mostly that's the solved problem. Yeah. People, so. people will compare the pointers and if they're not equal, do more work. Okay, so it's mostly a solved problem uh, in the type info at least. Yes? Uh, if you have existing library code that's not using inline namespaces, can you introduce uh, it's difficult without changing names of new functions. Um, yeah, I can't think of a way to do that easily. As, sorry, the question was, if you have an existing library that uh, or API that doesn't have inline namespaces, how, how can you upgrade? Yes? Uh, you mentioned about an SSL library, but it's a POC library. And do you think that POC libraries uh, don't have uh, a lot of problems to describe uh, when they distribute to a customer. Because C ABI is pretty stable usually. Um, right, it's open as a problem because C uh, ABI is stable. Um, maybe? The, 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 I think, uh, short, like, short uh, sorry? Short right, short, if, with dash F, short enums, you might uh, still. You just have like fewer guns to show yourself. Right, but and you also have slightly less protection with the name mangling in in a way. Um, uh, it's more of a different set of problems. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think uh, also like part of this and the comment about uh, we don't know really which compiler flags affect ABI. Uh, I think the safest approach is to 
just consider every compiler flag dangerous and just make sure that everything is the same. Uh, and if you're trying to do that, ideally you'd build open as well with the same uh, set of flags, the same compiler and everything also. All right. We're... Sounds good. All right, thank you.